from Microbe TV. This is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 177, recorded on November 5th, 2019. Dragon Yellow, and joining me here in the Microbe TV studio in New York City, Daniel Griffin. Hello, Vincent. Hello, everybody. And no Dixon. We are we are missing Dixon. <laughs> and, and the two forms of missing Dixon. One is he's not here, and the other is you know we're we're missing him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he he got the date wrong, and he's fishing in Pennsylvania apparently. So it's not like he can just show up you know i've been lis- i've been listening to some of the early twips yeah I don't know if people know but <laughs> twip just passed 10 years the right. first twip episode was huh. released october 15th 2009 so wow. we are yeah, a decade of twip holy crow that's that went <laughs> fast that's quite wow. something and I, I was actually worried because I was listening to them. Hmm. I was listening to the Sestode once. Yeah. And, you know, I, I can only listen to so many hours of Dixon in a row, <laughs> you know. And so I was like, I better stop because if I have to go and listen to Dixon again. And, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, um, the first, uh, I don't know how long, 25 episodes, he just went through the parasites and talked about them. They're really good, actually, for people that are maybe tuning in now. It's nice to go back and yeah, get yeah. some of the basic parasitology. Yeah. And uh, so TWIP was the second podcast I started after TWIV. TWIV was in 2008, I think. So this was about a year later. Okay. TWIV was working. People were listening. So I said, Dixon, you want to do Parasite? And so he said, yeah, since that was his thing, right? Mm-hmm. So, well, cool. 10 years. 10 years, 177 episodes. How long have you been on now? Do you remember? Um, Let's see. I don't know exactly. That would yeah. be good to check. I guess we could look through the archives because it was yeah. Daniel and the Parasite Den was the first one. So, Oh, it's- that would be easy. TWIP, Daniel, Parasite. <laughs> it's pretty funny. That is number 80, which would be January 2015. Okay. Yeah. Welcome, new TWIP host, Daniel Griffin. Look at that. Uh, wow. So come January, it'll be five years. That's, For you, yeah. Wow. Five years have <laughs> flown by. I wanted to uh, just note this uh, CDC article in MMWR, Progress Toward Global Eradication of Dracunculiasis. Mm. Um, has decreased from an estimated 3.5 million cases in 1986 to 28 cases in 2018. Wow. Emergence of guinea worm infections in dogs has complicated eradication efforts. You know, we've talked about that, and that is a challenge, particularly in Chad, I think is where they started to notice this. Um, But this is um, something I think we've talked about. Actually, our book is dedicated to the individual who I think personally um, made this their, their mission, uh, former President Jimmy Carter, mm-hmm. who I had the pleasure of meeting a, a few years back. And uh, he saw this problem, and, and I think Dix and I have often said he has done more as an ex-president than any other ex-president to take over 3 million cases a year of this really horrible malady and reduce it down to this point where it's, it's you know. Yeah. So uh, there were, oh boy, during this period, January through June 2019, the number of cases increased to 25 in three countries, Angola, Cameroon, and Chad. And Angola never had a case before. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. And 1,300 infected dogs cases. Wow. So they think the dogs are contributing to this. It's a big problem. It's too bad. You know what we need is we need, so for humans, they have these little straws, so we need to get dog straws. We need to teach the dogs to drink out of the filtered yeah. straws. But yeah. it's a problem because, right, the dogs are going to go right over to the water sources, and then they're going to lap it right up. They're going to ingest the copepods, right? Yeah. And they're going to have the uh, the life cycle. And then how how will they infect people? So it's it's really similar to humans, um, and I think we talked about this in otters. There's a, there's a guinea worm variant in otters, a guinea worm variant in several 
um, we'll say a dracunculus species that affects um, several different mammals. Mm -hmm. And so dogs, and just like humans, it tends to to gravitate, we'll say. Um, The adult female will be in the legs usually, Uh and then it will actually do the process with the blister, and and the dog will go into the water and will release the larvae. They get taken up by copepods, and then the next... Mm-hmm. the next dog or possibly yeah. person yeah wow so it's a tough one a lot of dogs infected and as you said you can't, you can't well, get the, them the, to drink through the a straw. amazing thing actually is when they decided to pursue this eradication mm-hmm. the belief we now realize it was wrong in retrospect was that these could only infect humans And I remember there was actually a twip where Dixon had said this, and then someone had written in and said, my wife says I'm wrong, Mm. (laughs) Dixon. And we we did not know. And so when it was undertaken, it was the idea, it's only in humans, we can stop it, we can get rid of it. And uh, maybe I'm glad we didn't know this, because maybe the funding and the um, attempt to eradicate it, to get it to where it is now, might not have gone forward if people say, oh, it's in dogs, you'll never succeed. But that Mm. pessimism... Mm -hmm wasn't there through ignorance, which, you know. Yeah. I don't think there's any direct connection with the dogs, but they they, they feel that it's probably, I think in particular in uh, Angola, the, um, the, the, it doesn't look like this individual got it from any other place, so it must have been a dog. Yeah, and a few studies in Chad support the dogs actually yeah. being involved in humans getting it. So it's, but boy, what a tremendous amount of progress. So I'm not as not as troubled. You know, if there's what 28 cases a year of uh, guinea worm, that's pretty darn good. Th- yeah, it's better than three and a half million, right? Yeah. So you think the same with polio? You know, we have 100 cases a year as opposed to half a million. Can we live with that? I worry more. <laughs> Can we live with that? You know, that, that's an excellent question. And I think with something like Dracunculus, something as this large animal with a complex life cycle, mm. um, it's not like it's suddenly going to blossom back out. I think that, you know, we'll be able to yeah. keep it under control. I don't, see, I don't see us ever getting back up to 3 million cases of guinea worm a year. Probably not, yeah. But with the anti-vaccination movement, with other social things, polio I worry about. If we don't yeah, really do get rid of it, it is something that could start coming, like we're seeing with measles now. Yeah, because we are not going to continue polio vaccination at the same level forever, because mm-hmm. it's just intense right now. WHO is immunizing everywhere, and the plan is to stop. And not continue this forever. So I don't, yeah, I think we have, to, these hundred cases are mainly, well, they're mainly in uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan, but then a few um, vaccine derived cases in areas where the coverage goes down. So there are two yeah. separate issues we have to deal with, unfortunately. All right, let's turn to uh, our case from TWIP 176. We, we got a lot of guesses. Remind us. What we have here. All right. For uh, those of you tuning in for the first time and those of you tuning back in, uh, let me present this case. And uh, this is a woman in her 20s. She's a school teacher working in the outer boroughs of New York City. And she wakes up on Saturday. Actually, she, she has a job on the weekends, and that's the problem because she wakes up Saturday thinking she's going to be doing her weekend job. Unfortunately, we Perhaps don't pay our teachers and uh, um, as much as we should, so that they're working weekend jobs as well. But she wakes up on the weekend, and she is covered in a rash. She has got a rash from head to toe. So she goes to an urgent care center, and they say, "Up, oh, looks like you're allergic to something." And they give her antihistamines, they give her steroids, and they uh, send her on her way. But unfortunately, this this rash is not responding that well to the antihistamine steroids. It's persisting, and she ends up going to an allergist. And the allergist does one of those panels where they inject you with about 100 different things and charge you $1,000. And (laughs) at the end of the day, they say, you know what? You're allergic to dust mites. Um, And she, she still has her rash. She's still not happy with what's happening. And now she goes to see her, her general practitioner. Um, her primary care doc. 
And the primary care doc gets this this history. She's still itchy. She still has this rash everywhere. And he does, um, it's sort of an old-fashioned thing, but he actually decides he's going to do a thorough examination. And as he's examining her head to toe, just like her rash, um, he gets to the fingers and he notices she has these small red lesions on the fingers and between the fingers, actually in the webbing. And he starts uh, going back a little bit more to the history. Um, There's some phone calls made. Actually, turns out several children in some of the classes that she teaches are suffering from a similar malady. And so he uh, he gives her a certain therapeutic. The rash goes away. Actually, has her repeat that therapeutic at a certain interval of time later, and uh, she gets all better. Okay. First case we guess is from Jim, Dear Twippers of the Might Sarcoptic. This poor teacher is mangy, but her dog cannot be the cause. Humans have their own version of scabies, and the sarcoptic mites involved are very efficient at moving from one host to another. By the time the teacher is symptomatic, scabies is probably well-established in class. The mites can also easily be brought home from school to be introduced to parents and siblings. Fortunately, there are a number of topical treatments available as well as more powerful drugs that can be used if needed. In addition, all clothing and bedding at home must be washed repeatedly to prevent the reinfection. It itches me to say it, but this is a PTA-level event. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, Jim, in Vancouver. That's good. All right. That's good. <laughs> uh, Chelsea writes, hello. My first instinct was scabies. And then other words like Janeway lesions and Osler nodes also floated by, but I don't think they apply here. Those are actually things you see in endocarditis. Um, I believe a scabies infection is supposed to be incredibly itchy and does go to the hands and between the fingers. They're pretty contagious and spread by contact. I would assume she got it from the kids. I met a woman in clinic a long time ago who had a very similar story. I forgot to mention that scabies are a mite, so that explains the allergen. And wow, the Wikipedia article is graphic in how it describes them. Or maybe I'm just imagining them burrowing into my skin. Permethrin cream should help. Interesting. Scabies in dogs is mange. This is a lot shorter than my previous answer, but I'm a bit of I'm in a bit of a rush. Finally, I get to submit something about missing so many episodes. Uh, thank you for making this awesome podcast, Chelsea. Kirsten writes: Diagnosis: Scabies mites. Crosses fingers as we would love to have the new atlas in our lab. Mahalo, Kirsten, who is uh, at the Daniel Inouye School of Pharmacy at the University of Hawaii. Nice. I'll take another one since that was short. Lita Wright, hello, Twipsters. I wasn't sure how to start off this email, so I'll stick with the weather. It's 79 degrees here in New Orleans with a humidity of 81%, so it feels like 85 degrees. It's still hurricane season, so we have our daily thunderstorms that cranks up the humidity to 90%, which makes 77 degrees weather feel like 82 degrees. I'm sure you've heard stories from Dixon. My diagnosis for Twip. Case study 176 is Sarcoptes scabii or scabies. My immediate answer when listening to this case was mites, but I became skeptical after hearing she was still itchy and rashy after her positive allergen test to dust mites. However, I quickly went back to my guess of mites when Dr. Griffin mentioned the small red lesions on the webbing of her fingers. I wasn't exactly sure which specific mites she was afflicted with as my memory failed to retain the details of my entomology class in grad school. Thankfully, PD6 is available for download as a PDF. I still want a signed copy, though, and after a quick control F for mites, I got my answer. Just to be sure and answer my own curiosities, I checked to see if there was any literature on cross-reactivity between scabies and dust mite antibodies, and there is. Here's the link to article for reference. The article's introduction even mentions that outbreaks of scabies are reported in nursing homes, daycare facilities, as well as kindergartens, hostels, and schools. As for my other curiosity, I wanted to check if the woman had a hypersensitivity or an adverse reaction to the medications. I can't remember where I heard learned this from, but I seem to recall in some cases of pruritus and skin rash, antihistamines and or steroids can worsen it. I could have completely made that up in my head, so ignore this if I'm horribly (laughs) mistaken. Either way, after re-listening to the case study, I noticed Dr. Griffin did not delineate between whether her rash itchiness became worse 
or simply was still present and bothersome after taking the antihistamines and prednisone. Her treatment was most likely a topical cream of permethrin or lindane to be applied on the affected area. Also, kudos to her GP for taking the time to do a more thorough exam. Thank you for the time and effort y'all put into this podcast. It allows me to stay in touch with my tropical medicine knowledge as I currently work in clinical oncology, which is interesting, but not as interesting as parasites. Just to share a fun little tidbit, the newest furry addition to my family, a stray seven-month-old puppy, Tonks's fecal test results came back positive for hookworms. Unfortunately, I didn't run the fecal sample myself, so I don't know which species she has. However, I did find proglottids after digging through her poop and took some pictures, videos <laughs> of the undulating tapeworm. As much as I feel bad for my poor pupper, I'm reveling in this real-life opportunity to talk and think about parasites again. Sorry for the long email. There's so much I want to say. Cheers. Lita, MPH, and TM. What's TM, Daniel? Do you know? I don't know, actually. So masters and so TM. So if she's a clinical oncologist, I don't know. What is TM? Do you want to Google that as I read Parks? Mm -hmm. Dear doctors of TWIP, I am a longtime listener and a newcomer to bench work in parasitology. Fortunate to be completing a post back at the NIH and excited to write you all for a first time. After hearing your last episode, immediately I focused in on two details of the case. First, that the patient is a teacher, and second, that she had a rash that was experienced as systemic, but upon closer examination showed lesions on her hands. Based on these criteria, my best guess is an infection with the obligate parasitic mite, Sarcoptes scabii. I think she has scabies. This appears to be supported by the antihistamine and story treatment not resolving her malady, uh, being boistered by the allergic sensitivity to dusk, dust mites, spread readily between children, and require 5% permethrin topical treatment and maybe ivermectin if things have progressed too far for topical treatment alone. Either way, it looks like she will be making many trips to the wash and fold to take care of all the laundry and keep from reinfecting herself. Thank you all for making this fantastic and accessible podcast. My best, Parks. So wash and fold. Is that like is that a British thing, you think? Or do we have those here? <laughs> I've never know. heard of that expression here, wash and fold. Uh, I assume that's a laundromat. Maybe that's a yeah, chain of probably. laundromats. Just wash and fold doesn't. Let me look it up. Wash and fold. Maybe it is here in the U.S. Yeah, New Jersey's number one wash and fold. Okay. <laughs> By the way, MPHTM, Master of Public Health in Tropical Medicine. Really? Awesome. There you go. TM is tropical medicine. I guess Dixon would have known that, right? Um, I do not know. Probably. <laughs> Katie Jane writes, hi, all. This is my first time writing in, and... I hope I do not make too much of a fool of myself. Not possible here. No one, only Dixon, right? <laughs> I'm currently residing in Wausau, Wisconsin, north central part of the state, and am a livestock producer and instructor of agricultural sciences at the local technical college. I am also a British citizen and have been fortunate enough to explore this wonderful world of litter, including the suburbs of New York City and Long Island, although admittedly I prefer upstate. After doing a search on PD-7 for parasitic diseases involving a skin rash, I ruled out many due to geographical unlikelihood and narrowed it down to the following two. Toxocariasis due to toxocaricanus, a disease primarily of young children with infections common in North America. However, it usually presents with fever, which was not mentioned in this case. It has also not spread person to person, which, although not specifically stated in the case study, was implied by the fact that several of the children in the class also presented with similar symptoms, which leads me to scabies due to Sarcoptes scabii, presents with a generalized itchy rash, although on further inspection, mites themselves are found predominantly between the fingers and on the wrists. Aha, this matches our case study. It is also contagious in the New York State Health Department states that it is a common infectious disease and infestations can occur in child care centers. Upon further research, I found that people suffering from scabies will also react to antigens for dust mites, which could explain the allergist's results for our patient. Very interesting. 
I therefore think that this is the most likely suspect in our case study. Treatment with permethrin, which as a livestock producer is something we usually have on hand. Hmm. I apologize if my answer is too long. If I'm wrong, well, I've now tried once and should probably try again. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to write in. Well, you should you should definitely try again um, because uh, that's how you learn this stuff, right? I would say that's the best way to learn. Like, put yourself out there, think it through. Um, what was it? Lee Iacocca was the famous guy for saying we learn the most from our mistakes, but I prefer my employees to not learn so much. <laughs> <laughs> yes, not make so many mistakes, right? Uh, Chris writes, hello, Twipsters. Uh, we, we like our listeners to learn a lot. So, Hello, Twipsters. It is a cold and windy 52F 11C here in Stony Brook, Long Island. Sorry for my absence. But now that my comprehensive exam is over, I can get back into all the fantastic microbe TV podcasts. Anyone... Anyhow, anywho, on to this month's guess. I would reckon that this patient is suffering from scabies mites, nasty mites that could be extremely irritating and that like to live in between fingers. These mites could be transmitted person to person, and the teacher in this case most likely caught them from their students. I already have a textbook proudly displayed in my office, so no need to put me in the running for a book. Unfortunately, no parasite pictures or videos to share with you this month, but hopefully next month I will have some new ones. Once again, thanks for the great podcast as always, including the others such as Twiv. They have made processing hundreds of bifalves and a few fish for disease diagnostics much more interesting. I would love if you brought on some more guests similar to TWIV to talk about their research, as I know there are many parasitologists in the tri-state area that would most likely love joining in on a conversation. Personally, I would love to hear from some of the local wildlife parasitologists, but that's just my two cents. Lastly, to all the other listeners out there, I would highly recommend going to TWIP's Patreon. I, as a broke grad student, personally gave a $5 monthly pledge, less than a beer at a brewery. <laughs> Vincent and his co-hosts have produced thousands of hours of material, so giving a dollar or five a month is a small sacrifice compared to the time all the hosts have devoted to this educational program. Warm regards, Chris. And uh, thank you for our little uh, <laughs> Patreon plug. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. And I know Chris has suggested some local parasitologists uh, we sh we will yeah we we have to get some more guests on twip we have tons on twip <laughs> just tons <laughs> yeah we should do that i think that would be fun and the and chris is out in long island he said there's some people out there we could go to so dixon and i could come out that would be great some afternoon and we can uh, interview some of them we could even potentially head out to stony brook sometime yeah. so peter writes dear greetings dear doctors of the good ship twip I strongly suspect that the woman in the case reported in TWIP 176 has scabies caused by an infestation of the mite. Sarcoptes scabii, only a small number of adult females required. This page on Everyday Health gave a good description of the symptoms and treatment. Antihistamine and permethrin alongside decontaminating the house. I checked PD7 to ensure the web page's accuracy, of course. The weather in Khartoum is hot and humid. I've been here for a week teaching microbial pathogen bioinformatics with a focus on practical analysis of M. tuberculosis whole genome sequencing samples. Wow, very cool. That is very cool. Thank you. Khartoum. <clears throat> Karen writes, Dear Twip Twio, I guess it'll be just the Twip duo today, but <laughs> I'm pretty sure the answer to the case study is scabies, Sarcoptes scabii. I find it very interesting, and the rashly areas of the body are not necessarily where the actual mites are located. Crazy immune system, Karen. <laughs> can take another one. All right. Melissa writes, Dear Twip Professors, this is my first time attempting to crack a case. Here goes. I think our young school teacher may have scabies, which is caused by the arthropod Sarcoptes scabii, also known as the itch mite. To venture slightly further, I'd guess that she has ordinary scabies rather than the Norwegian crusted scabies, crusted scabies. The clues that led me to this hypothesis are, one, red lesion on and between fingers, one of the telltale symptoms are of Sarcoptes scabii infection. Some of her, two, some of her students also have these symptoms. Therefore, it must be relatively easy to transmit, again, 
Sarcoptes scabii fits the bill. Three, she is not immunocompromised, which tends to be a risk factor for crusted scabies. Then, after some very brief reading, more pieces of information in the case fits with Sarcoptes scabii infection. One, Sarcoptes scabii is fairly common. Therefore, it's possible to find it in the outer boroughs of New York. Two, her allergy test. Daniel never specified why her allergist thought dust mites may not be the cause of her symptoms, but perhaps her reaction to dust mites was not particularly strong. There is some evidence of IgE cross-reactivity between Sarcoptes scabii and household dust mites. Her treatment was likely something along the lines of 5% permethrin cream. The CDC website for health professionals outline a couple of different treatment options. Additionally, the local health department should be notified as there is community spread of the parasite. People who've been in close contact should be tested and treated for scabies. Additionally, cloth materials in the classroom as well as anything that has been in contact with either her or her students should be laundered or sealed in airtight plastic bags for at least three days to make sure any Sarcoptes scabii in the environment is killed off. Wow, this email turned out much longer than I anticipated. (laughs) Thank you all for this great podcast that 100% makes my time in the lab much more fun. Melissa, from a relatively sunny Toronto at an acceptable 12 degrees Celsius. And then we've got a bunch of uh, references here. Let's see what we have here in New York in terms of temperature. Um, it's a, it's pretty nicely sunny out, right? It is. So I can't look behind me. It's 15 Celsius and sunny. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty mild. And here we are in November. All right, here's Kevin. A scabrous education. Proverb, tis better than riches to scratch where it itches. <laughs> Quote, none but kings and princes should have the itch for the sensation of scratching is so delightful. James I. Some things in medicine never change, demonstrated by consulting Chapter 20 of Tilbury Fox's 1875 dermatology book, which describes our TWIP 176 case to a T. Quote, this is a most important disease to be well acquainted with. Whilst its frequency is extreme, its features happily are very definite and its facility of cure great, but mistakes are very (laughs) frequently made in its diagnosis. Dr. Griffin's case does not mention if our patient is married and if so, for how long. This could prompt the question, does our patient have the seven-year itch, that metaphorical pruritus that occurs consequent to the longers that invariably accompany seven years of marriage. More to the point, PD-7 contains a kind of Vitruvian woman type of illustration that depicts body regions favored by the itch mite. It is a dead giveaway for TWIP-176. The causative organism in this case was named Acarus humanus subcutaneus by Linnaeus in 1747. It is now called Sarcoptes scabii variety hominis. I will dutifully offer a differential diagnosis. By coincidence, the New York Times Sunday Magazine diagnosis column 10 2019 presents the case of an itchy man. Scabies is mentioned, but the culprit was Toxocara. We can add other nematodes to the diagnosis of parasitical itch, for example, strongyloides and cutaneous larval migrants from hookworm infection. A return to TWIP 157 can help augment our differential by considering bed bug bites, flea bites, or other incidental mite exposures such as tyrophagus, trixacurus, and glycophagus. However, the daycare setting, typical symptoms, and very characteristic lesion rash distribution in our 176 case points unequivocally to scabies. Relevant to our case is the fact that skin tests may not differentiate between the dust mite, dermatophagoides farinae, and ascabii. Our patient's trip to the allergist resulted in a delay in diagnosis and maybe threw a bit of gasoline on the fire via the administration of steroids, mother's milk, to peripatetic <laughs> mite. Bagoli et al. in the 2014 case report strikingly similar to TWIP-176 reminds us that it is important that allergists be aware of the antigenic cross-reactivity between house dust and scabies mites and its implications. A few other relevant facts. Typical scabies usually spares the head and face. Favored sites of rash infection are hands, wrists, and elbows. Other areas that are enjoyed, genitals, feet, buttocks, axillae, breast, and waistline. 
The Arlan et al. 2017 reference in the end notes exhaustively reviews the biology, genetics, and immunology of this pest, as well as discussing the development of diagnostic blood tests and vaccines. Like its fellow degrader of social status, the bed bug, these mites transmit no known disease. Fomites are generally not considered as significant in scabies transmission, the classic studies being Melan B's 1940s human experiments. Arilon states, thus in homes, schools and nursing homes, extensive cleaning, disinfection, and laundering should not be required to eliminate scabies mice in dry climates. Leaving a bed, bedroom, bedding, and clothing isolated for 48 hours at room temperature should result in the death of scabies mice. Mites. Patients should be given reassurance and education to prevent development of delusional parasitosis. The WHO classifies scabies as a neglected tropical disease and has been involved in mass drug administration trials. Scabies can affect 5 to 10% of children in low resource nations, resulting resulting in misery, degradation of education, and other medical sequelae such as impetigo and post streptococcal glomerulonephritis. Typical scabies must be differentiated from scabies in the immunosuppressed and crusted or Norwegian scabies, both of which require a separate discussion. Treatment is well described in the CDC and WHO websites. It's interesting to note that the ancient remedy of 5 to 10% sulfur in Vaseline is still a potential cure and is safe to use in infants. It's a remedy you could actually make at home. Note that ivermectin is not FDA-approved for scabies, but is CDC-recommended for treatment failures and crusted scabies. Thanks for scratching an itch in my mind. And then, of course, following are the endnotes, which I suggest everyone uh, take a look at because they're very informative and amusing. Microbe.tv slash twip, and you'll find in episode 177 a link to the notes. He writes, yes, the word scabies occurs in the Bible and gives several quotes for that. Old textbook descriptions, uh, he he lists many, many of them. Terminal curiosities, scabies in cattle. Great illustrations on how to construct cattle dip stations. (laughs) Cutaneous mite infestations in domestic animals are a huge problem. So I guess that's where our veterinary person who wrote in earlier said they have this on hand, permethrin all the time, and I guess it's for animals, yeah. right? Permethrin is a good, I'll say, sort of general uh, ectoparasitic uh-huh. agent. He, he, he provides, uh, Kevin provides a picture, Reuben Friedman's book plate, Dr. Friedman's specialty was scabies, an itchy affliction caused by the creature on his book plate. He's got an illustration of the mite. And we have a little a picture of a mite and, you know, this is his book plate, which is a sticker you would put in your book to show it's yours, right? Oh, so it's I like ex, ex Libris <laughs> like. Reuben Friedman, right? So this is my book. Wow. And he's got this 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 house constructed with names. And on one side, he's got Hippocrates, and on the other, Pester. But he's got this huge mite right in the in center between. there. And then we have a news flash. Uh, this part of the story, I fear, can be classified as Fake news is a Cleveland, Ohio Summit Academy will be closed on Thursday and Friday after scabies were discovered at the school. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Give some treatment information. Uh, Annals of cartoons focus on pruritic persons. TWIP 176 featuring an educator suffering with a malady in previous centuries known as the itch, stimulated me to examine two cartoon characters, both with the name Itch, Itchy, Itchy Brother, and um, Twitchy. That's pretty funny. More history here. This is quite the email. Yeah, it's great. Thank you, Kevin. As usual, you'll be (laughs) able to make a second volume of your... uh, Whip guesses pretty soon, I would I would think. Yes. All right, go ahead, and All right, Dan. Ted. Ted writes, taking a stab at an easy one here. This sounds like scabies, especially given the location of the lesions between the finger webs and the evidence of contacts with similar symptoms. She likely received permethrin as treatment. Ivermectin is a choice for severe 
infection. But given that, that she does not have evidence of Norwegian scabies, i.e. crusting lesions on her extremities, severe rash over all extremities, she likely would not benefit or need systemic treatment. A presentation such as that would prompt me to consider further workup for a cause of an immunocompromised state. Hopefully the children in her classroom are also being treated as well as she would be at high risk of reinfection. Working my way through residency, but still very much enjoy the reminders and science available through TWIP. Carry on, gentlemen. Also, I already have a copy of PD6, so you can keep me out of the running for a copy. Thanks. Ted Rader, MDMS, PGY2. What's PGY2 mean? Postgraduate year two. So okay. internal medicine is three years. So your first year will be the, the intern year. Mm-hmm. And then you become a PGY2 and finally a PGY3. And v- VCUHS is Virginia Commonwealth. Very good, Ted. Thank you for telling us you already have a book. I appreciate that. <laughs> Adam writes, hi, my guest for case 176 is scabies. Also, I liked it better when TWIP was biweekly. More TWIP is better. <laughs> Regards, Oscar Adam from Holmstad, Sweden, which I, I was in Sweden this summer, uh, Adam, and, and uh, recorded three TWIVs there. Carlos writes, hi, TWIP team. Sounds like the patient from 176 has scabies because of the intertriginous itchy and what sounds like inflamed papules. She could have acquired this illness from her contact with children. Hopefully no one else acquired scabies from close contact. Possible treatments include permethrin cream from head to toe or a single dose of ivermectin. Looking forward to the next episode. Caitlin writes, dear Twipster gods, the teacher has scabies. The between the fingers is a dead giveaway. She probably got it from the children she teaches as kids spread everything. Treatment, topical, permethrin cream, or ivermectin. I don't have anything clever, so here is an historical anecdote. According to legend, the Chinese warlord Yuan Shao once refused to go to war because his youngest son had scabies, and he was too worried about the boy's health to leave. Supposedly, this missed opportunity was the beginning of his doom. At the time, scabies would have been treated with herbal mixtures that were apparently fairly effective. I'll still take the ivermectin. Caitlin in Seattle, where it's getting chilly by American standards. Maybe he didn't want to go to war. (laughs) Just used it as an excuse. I suspect. May writes, Dear doctors, long-time listener, but first time having a go at guessing a case study. Hopefully I'm not too late for this month's case. When hearing this case, I immediately thought of scabies, sarcoptes, scabia. I reached this conclusion thanks to the useful mention of the lesions between and on the fingers. I then went to PD-7, used everyone's best friend, Control-F, to search for hands where I found none other than scabies. Waking up in the morning with a rash and itching is also characteristic of scabies and most find itching is worse in the night. Her general practitioner likely would have taken a skin scraping to confirm. If this is the case, I would expect treatment to be lidane or permethrin administered in a cream. Hopefully the children at the school are also followed up as their families, seeing as it spread easily. Thanks for putting together such a great show. It has gotten me through many PCR runs in the lab this year, looking for strong aloides stercoralis as my honors research. Sincerely, May, from a currently quite hot Adelaide, Australia. Very nice. Thank you, May. Ben writes, Dear Plasmidium Faltwiparium. (laughs) It seems my email from last episode got lost, but that's okay because my diagnosis was wrong. Sounds like the woman from TWIP 176, along with some of the children in her class, are suffering from scabies. Treatment would need to be extended to all affected children and possibly other children in the same classrooms to ensure the outbreak comes to an end. I've always found it curious how so many of our behavioral and hygiene habits exist to avoid ectoparasites. Yet, public awareness of ectoparasites, with the exception of head lice, is extremely poor. Something that might be useful for a lot of TWIP listeners is the newly launched Parasite Slack. A link to the Parasite Slack can be found on the Parasite Slack Twitter. Essentially, it is a parasitology message board with some specific parasite channels, along with channels for job advertisements, protocols in parasitology, and parasitology resources. I, of course, made sure to mention Parasitic Diseases 7th Edition and TWIP in the resource section. It's currently sunny and 37C in Adelaide, South Australia. Following on from a beautiful 30C during the Malaria in Melbourne conference earlier in the week, 
Newton may have seen further by standing on the shoulders of giants, but Toxoplasma took the giants closer (laughs) (laughs) to what it wanted to see. Keep up all the wonderful work. Two males from, two in a row from Adelaide. How about that? We had May and then Ben. Yeah. I think Ben won a book. Right, Ben? I think so. I'm going to check. Uh, Sophia writes, Dear Hello, doctors, and a happy belated birthday to Dr. De Pommier. Yeah, that was June 5th. <laughs> okay. But he's not here, and he's going to miss it. I hope this email makes it before the new TWIP is aired. My guess for this case is Scabies. I'm keeping this short, as I think you'll get loads of email, but I would like to hear more about how this teacher got infected. I don't think the Babesia case was easy, by the way. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. All the best to you from Greece, Sophia. P.S., you used to talk about the weather in this podcast and other things. I wouldn't mind if you went back to doing it again. <laughs> just thought, well, uh, we just you, told you, you did the mention the weather, right? I don't know what other things we used to talk about. We do, you know, talk if about you, a lot of things. We there used to be a little more of a pre-case banter, right? It really? Yeah, there was a little bit more of a pre. What now we, we're what like we getting banter? right to business. You know, Dixon would usually talk about some stuff. Oh. Usually he'd have a story or two. It would be like, oh, that's a really close friend of mine. Oh, they died a year ago. How come no one told me? <laughs> so, well, we'll try and uh, do that again. We'll banter more. Yeah. Um, I'm looking up Ben to see if uh, he's won a book. Uh, Let me, I'll read so, the next one so while, you're, while you're looking. Um, Western U Global Health Track Students. Dana, Stephen, and Chris Wright. Hello, TWIP professors. We believe the most likely diagnosis to be scabies due to the parasite Sarcoptes scabii, given the characteristic lesions between his fingers and the fact that some of her students have similar symptoms. The therapeutic use would be a topical scabicide, such as 5% per methrin. Andrew writes... Good day again from Pongaroa, New Zealand. No book one yet, but ever hopeful. <laughs> Just keep trying. Weather here is decidedly spring like with 21C and clear skies, except for some cirrus and a UV index of nine. A good day for sitting in shade and solving the puzzle of the young teacher with the rash. My diagnosis it might be scabies. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I like that. For me, the clue that set me on that track was the lesions between the fingers. I'd heard of this somewhere before, probably when my daughter was going to kindergarten, and I, like most parents, were constantly and almost obsessively looking for signs of parasites. I was not aware that it could cause a head-to-toe rash, and the images of crusted scabies are the stuff of horror films. The insightful question came from Vincent, who asked about the teacher's family, as treatment of the whole family would be advisable, and this critter is very contagious with skin-to-skin contact. Interesting fact about Pongaroa, it is the birthplace of Maurice Wilkins, who got the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1962, along with James Watson and Francis Crick, a tiny rural town that is quite proud of his achievement. Cheers, Andrew. Yeah, that's right, Uh, because we talked recently about that Nobel Prize with Erling Norby, and they gave it to Watson and Crick and a crystallographer who was a pioneer in solving structures. Yep. Very cool. And now, so now we had two from Australia and one from New Zealand. The Australia ones, it's hot, and now here it's 21 hmm. in New Zealand. New Zealand is even further south, right, than uh, Australia. Yeah. yeah. Well, there we have it, a nice collection of guesses. And I, I was interested to see that one or two people talked about having Toxocara, but there's no fever here, but you would get similar rash, is that right? I don't know if you'd get a similar rash, and I think that's what made mm-hmm. people rule it out. Um, so the, um, and I think this is interesting. Well, we only have what one more person left to guess, Vincent. Well, you, well, me. Oh, I, I thought of of uh, scabies immediately because we've done a couple of scabies on this show. So, uh, and I remember the one guy who t- went to a doc with his wife because he he was afraid he was going to give it to her. Remember. <laughs> that was one of your cases, I think. And he'd gotten from another woman, I think. Okay. Or at least he'd been with another was woman. Was this when we talked about you can't get it sitting on a on a toilet seat if <laughs> you're by if you're by yourself? <laughs> um, you know, I see a lot of scabies and um and yes, th- this was scabies. 
Um, and it is interesting. I see when I see it in teachers, it tends to be the teachers that teach special subjects like art or music yeah. that have a lot of um, exposure to lots of students. So it isn't usually like a, a core classroom teacher who has just her group of, yeah, let's say, yeah, 30 yeah. kids. Hmm. Um, and also, you know, I'll say with ones that art or music where it's sort of hands on, right? They might be like helping the children directly and there's more yeah. contact yeah, involved. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it's interesting. I'm impressed that everyone got this and so many people, because if you look at how expensive this diagnosis was for this poor mm -hmm. woman, mm -hmm. like she started off with an urgent care visit, yeah. then she ends up on medicines and then she ends up getting a thousand dollar allergy workup. And then she goes to the primary care doc. Right. And, and we just have our, you know, our, our TWIP listeners are brilliant, obviously, mm -hmm. right? Because they just, you know, what do we give them like a few sentences? And not only do they know the diagnosis, and it was 100%, 100% of them get the diagnosis, yeah, it's great. then they even know how to treat it. And uh, I really, actually, what I really enjoyed, I, I was like when people dispel myths. So I want to go to uh, our myth dispeller. Was it Kevin, who did that with the whole thing about um, the, the contact issue? Like, you don't have to... Uh, disinfect your world at yeah, like 48 right. hours and you know so i remember there was the issue with the school you know and they're gonna send you're gonna like do some massive disinfection basically just everyone leave the building for the weekend come back on monday and you're all good yeah, yeah. um you know th that's the thing with mites and lice um a lot of these organisms they they need us and if we go away they go away um so yeah, that's yeah. A good point just leave the room empty Exactly. She treats herself. Yeah. She goes away for the weekend. She comes back. It's all good. Be good. Yeah. Um, That's a good idea. And, and the, the, uh, there are a couple uh, interesting things. I really, you know, I, I always pick cases that I think have some interesting aspect about them. Mm -hmm. um, so one is I like the significant allergic reaction that she experienced. Right. Um, because we talk about um, where you see the mites. And the different, and I remember Dixon always brings this up. Well, the mites are in these certain locations. Why do you get the rash in other places? And a lot of the rash is, well, the rash is, it's the immune response to the mites and to the mite antigens, the mite allergens, we'll call them. It's not actually necessarily the mite itself that is causing the rash. And um, yet, yeah, it was yesterday. So I, I covered the weekend and yesterday I was at one of the hospitals mm -hmm. and, uh, there, there was a case of scabies again. I see a lot of scabies, mm. and uh, I was talking about it with. There was a PGY three, right? Mm -hmm. Internal mm -hmm. medicine, actually, family practice PGY three. There was a medical student, and there was a um, a clinician, actually, Doctor Hernandez, right? So, Doctor Hernandez actually trained in Mexico, and um, the medical student who trained here in the states, he said, "Oh, yes, scabies. I remember that. It affects between the fingers." Dr. Hernandez was saying, oh, I remember seeing scabies where it gets all in the scalp. Hmm. And that's something I think we've talked about, too. When I go to Panama, when I go to these areas in the tropics, and you see villages where 15% of the people have scabies, and it's a heavy infection in the tropics, scabies presents differently than we see in the uh, hmm. temperate climates. So it was interesting to see that firsthand when he had been trained yeah, and seen yeah, scabies. Cool. He was seeing classic tropical um, scabies in the young children, severe infestations involving the scalp and the buttocks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then the U.S. trained um, medical student, fingers, um, you yeah. know, had seen, you know, in their training, it between the fingers and the classic temperate scabies presentation. Do we, un do we understand why it's different? Um, we think a lot of it is the level of infection. Mm -hmm. um, in the tropics, you go to these villages and people are just heavily infected. So it's it's a crusted, it's a severe scabies. But they they do not have it between their fingers or they do, but in addition, they have it on you their You probably head. don't even notice it. Yeah. And as you start reducing the amount of scabies in these villages, you start seeing more of a temperate type presentation. Mm -hmm. So I think it's level of infection. So this is a global infection right it is everywhere, everywhere where there's people yeah and but it's a strictly human mite right so the the mites have um just like a virus right they have a how strange yeah. a, you know they have a, and and it actually has a lot to do with the, what they can grab onto what environments mm -hmm. they can live in what they can burrow into so your dog mites don't affect humans the human yeah. mites yeah, don't yeah. affect dogs reason i'm asking is because this 
in principle, is eradicable because it only infects humans. Yes. But you'd have to treat everyone globally. Just like we're vaccinating everyone <laughs> for polio, we'd have to treat everyone for scabies, and that's not likely to happen because it just doesn't matter that much, right? Yeah. I mean, well, so I think I've talked about the experience in Panama when uh, the floating doctors group will go into these these villages for the mm-hmm. first time. They'll introduce soap. They'll start treating people for scabies. They'll treat not only the patient, but also the family members. And year after year, you start seeing maybe one or 2% of the people infected with scabies. So over time, you actually can start to get rid of it. But right. then you see a situation like this in the schools, right? One child yeah. comes in, yeah. spreads it to the classmates, spreads it to the teachers, and it's quite something to, you know, Department of Health, get involved, find everyone who's infected and get rid of scabies. Because if one person maintains the scabies, that's another source of these big outbreaks. Now, this patient, um, was you gave her a therapeutic and the rash went away. Uh, do you know what happened with the school? They actually went through a whole Department of Health, the kids, mm-hmm. they, yeah, it was quite quite a process. And in stuff like this, yeah, the Department of Health will get involved. Okay. Very I think good. one of our one of our listeners, emailers wrote in about this is a PTA level event. Yeah, yeah. It's very good. <laughs> a PTA level event. All right. Well, speaking of events, let's give away a copy of uh I guess we have P D six still we're giving away, right? Yes. Yeah. We don't have PD7. How many yet. how many copies do we have cuz then we'll be moving on to PD7. These these are the last PD6s. How many I, do we I have? I have two here signed. Okay. Only, but you have more, right? Right. Don't you have more uh, somewhere else in the, at the factory or wherever it is? I they, think we're done. I we might be moving on to PD7 really? here. Yeah. I thought you said you had hundreds of, of We're six. we're all done. PD6 is there's oh, no more good. PD6s. All right, so these are the last two and then These are collectors items. <laughs> and we'll ship these out at some point, but uh, then you'll get seven in at some point, right? So we already have. We have. Um, we've done another printing of PD seven, and um, I mean this book has been oh, okay. tremendous. So thank you everybody for. But um, since we sort of redid parasitic diseases with the sixth edition, mm-hmm. we have um, over forty thousand copies have been distributed. Right. That's great to over a hundred different countries. Mm-hmm. Um, we've supplied it to nine different medical schools, universities throughout the world. Um, Very cool, and of course TWIP listeners. And so now we have 17 entries. I've skipped the few people who said they had one and Kevin, who I know won. So 17, let's generate a random number between one and 17 and generate the number. It is number 11. And 11 happens to be, let me scroll up. Is that Adam or have you renumbered? Uh, Let's see. Kevin is skipped. It's past Kevin. (laughs) Uh, where are we oh my gosh I'm still scrolling Ted said he had a copy so Adam yes Adam in Homestad Sweden wow Adam send uh, your address and phone I will need for international shipping twip at microbe.tv but you'll have to wait a bit because we need to get some PD7 and then it has to be signed And Daniel is here rarely, so. And now Dixon's not here. (laughs) We have to get them both in. So uh, Adam is the winner from Holmstad, Sweden. I know I shouldn't say Stad, Holmstad, Sweden. I had a very good time in Sweden. I was in Stockholm and Schmugen, and we drove back and forth. So I saw things in between, including Linkoping. That was cool. Oh, what is that? What is (laughs) Linkoping? It's a town uh, in between. There are lots of pings in between <laughs> okay. Stockholm and Smugen on the west coast. And one of the Linko ping, actually it's Lin- Linsho ping, I think is the way you say it. And there are other show pings in between. They're very pretty though. All right. We have a cool paper today. I love I love this paper. A rotifer derived paralytic compound prevents transmission of schistosomiasis to a mammalian host in PLOS biology. From Gao, Yang, Lewis, Yao, Collins, Swedler, and Newmark, University of Wisconsin, University of Illinois, the Biomedical Research Institute in Rockville, Howard Hughes. And this is just cool. So this is all about schistosomes, which you only can treat with praziquantel, right? 
Pretty much. Yeah, that's that's the problem. That's that is the problem. So we need more drugs. We need more drugs. Um, you know, they, they've done a few things where they've tried the the artemisin compounds, which, yeah. you know, I, every time I bring that up, Dick says, oh, my, you know, because the last thing you want to do is start overusing, you know, our malaria medicines, and then we lose those. And so um, right now, praziquantel is pretty much what we use to treat um, schistosomiasis. Okay. I mean, this is just so cool that they found this uh, factor in a, in a rotifer that lives in the the snail intermediate host, I love the I love the story. I was actually up early this morning walking walking the dogs with my wife mm-hmm. through a nearby park, and um, I was actually you know telling the story. That's apparently what my wife and I do. We walk around and talk Tell about stories. parasites. <laughs> um, and it's such a great story because it it goes back and you know it, I'd love Dixon to do the way Dixon like tells stories and he sort of like imagines the way things actually happened. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, here it is back in the 70s and people are doing research on the schistosomes and they're, they're trying to uh, to work with them in the lab. And some people are just doing a great job and it's all good. Other people are struggling. Like, oh, I can't, can't get this stuff to work. And uh, and then someone, you know, asked the question, well, maybe there's something, like, maybe there's something here going on. Yeah. And, and they realize that the people who uh, have the snails and they, they clean the water, they put in fresh water, they go ahead, you know, the meticulous people, right? Everything's working just well for them. But then, oh, change the water, you know, in a few days. And, and the people that just sort of leave the water in there for a while, uh, they start having problems. But they only have problems sometimes. Mm -hmm. And then they start to realize if you look at these snails, they've got like this sort of this mat growing on the on the snail. Mm -hmm. And if you look closely, this mat are these animacules, right? These rotifers. And there's different species of rotifers. And back here it is in 1981. Someone finally realizes what's going on 40 years ago. And cool. snails that have a particular animacule, a particular um, species of rotifer, if you leave them in and the, the water's not been changed for, let's say, 24 to 48 hours, and then you try to do your schistosomiasis research, it doesn't work. There's something mm-hmm. in the water. Right. 40 years later, you know, not yeah, quite 40, 40 years. Not quite 40 years later. Yeah, it's great. But yeah, about 40 years later, you start to see a little trickle in the literature where people are starting to say, hmm, maybe there's something interesting here. And then, you know, there, there's a little bit of a literature over the fast, last few years. And then finally, these guys pull out this paper. So let, let's do the life cycle because that's important for this, right? Yes. So we have adults which reside in us. Yes. Right? They lay eggs. Mm-hmm. The eggs go into the water where they hatch. They form. So we should. Yeah, this is this is great. I mean, fecal contamination of yeah, water. Yeah. So schist- schistosomes um, are living in pairs, right? You've got this large mm-hmm. male schistosome, and he's got this gynecophoral canal, and the and the woman, is the female there. schistosome, yeah. call her a woman, is laying in there, mm-hmm. and they are basically they're in constant copula. They're, right. they're having sex constantly. constantly. Yeah. And the female is actually, um, all the eggs are coming out. Right. And the eggs are actually, these are living in the venules, mm-hmm. right? So they're getting, they're getting actually through the wall. They're ending up with these eggs in, in the feces for Schistosoma mansoni, the species we're talking about here. Um, and then the, the egg comes out and ends up in the water. Now, how does that happen? Well, you you were <laughs> you, you were fecal contamination. You're not using sewers and toilets. Yeah, this or, is like the Great Lakes story, right? You know, yeah. you got all the people an outhouse are on defe- the lake, yeah, <laughs> or workers are defecating next to the work area, and the- or you're you're working in the rice paddies, yeah. and you know it's in the middle of the day, and you know it's you know yeah. you're, you're you're like oh, I'll just head home for you know <laughs> yeah. So then the eggs get in the water, and then the egg hatches in the water. And out comes the myrcidium stage. Mm-hmm. And the myrcidium stage then goes, I, I was actually listening to the early, uh, so this is where, you you know, so what what happens? Where does the myrcidium go? Myrcidium goes into the snail. It right? goes into the snail. A particular snail, which is what we call an intermediate host. And then out, out of the And there's the snail, a development stage a in development the snail. snail. Right, and then it becomes a sporocyst, right? Close. Not now it comes out as the circaria, right? Circaria. 
And the circaria mm-hmm. actually um, are, they're actually attracted to the light. They're attracted to us. They, they get onto a human being. Mm-hmm. And then this is actually interesting. This is kind of, this is why I thought it was okay to swim in the schistosome infected, infested um, lake in Malawi, right? Um, you get out of the water and as the water starts to dry, it takes about 30 minutes, we think, for a schistosome, mansoni, and, and mm-hmm. some of these other. They will actually penetrate the hair follicles. Right. And then they get into you. It's just so creepy. And then once they're <laughs> in you, right, there's actually this migration, and the, the males and the females come together, and they end up in they the- They find each other, as Dixon was saying. find each other. They find each other delightful. <laughs> but you have to have two. You right? do. You do. You right. need the male and the female. They don't come in together. They come in separately and find each other. Exactly. Right? So you need to be infected by more than one. Um, and yeah. Uh, yeah. So it, what they say here, for decades, inconsistency in circarial production by snails and infectivity of mammalian hosts has been observed in labs, as you mm-hmm. said, and they couldn't figure it out. But then it was found that the shells of these snails are colonized by rotifers. And these reduce the output of circaria and their motility and their infectivity. And in fact, if you just have rotifer conditioned water, <laughs> you grow rotifers and take the water only, that will inhibit circaria. It will actually paralyze them. And that's the basis of this. Yeah, uh, so they paper. have the, they have this nice figure one, right? And they actually throw in the the sporocyst that you mentioned. I try to simplify mm-hmm. it, but because in my mind, you know, the the two which you know sort of make it simple for people, the circaria is going to infect humans. The myrosidium is going to infect the snails, mm-hmm. right? So yeah. somehow, and then here we have these are actually this wonderful. They have photos of the swimming circaria, right? So if you have conditioned water from this, these rotifers, which are um, multicellular small organisms, microscopic organisms with a very characteristic um, f- feature at one end, which is where they take in nutrients, but apparently they produce something that uh, paralyzes the circaria so they can't move. And it only happens with one of the two species that you find on the snail. In fact, that's where this story begins. They isolated rotifers from st- snail shells, they found two species. They grew them up, they produce rotifer conditioned water, (laughs) Mm -hmm. and they add the water to (laughs) circaria, which would be the swimming stage in the water. And within five minutes from one species, R. rotatoria, the circaria get paralyzed. They stop swimming, they sink to the bottom of the dish. And the other one didn't have any effect. So they said, let's purify it. So they do a variety of, of approaches to purify it, and they end up uh, purifying it. It's a large molecular weight compound. You know, the, during the purification, they have an assay. They just add the fractions to circaria. Yeah. It's a beautiful assay. It's a what, wonderful assay, what right? What paralyzes them. They get what <laughs> Why they are my cool. assays not this yeah. easy to do? <laughs> Schistosome <laughs> paralysis factor, SPF. I thought SPF was a suntan <laughs> rating. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, now you're going to have like SPF factor 12, you know. <laughs> so it turns out by NMR, they can see it's a tetracyclic alkaloid. Yes. Or, or as Dixon would say, dihydroxy chicken wire. <laughs> a lot of rings stuck together. Yep. Uh, and, uh, you know, they can purify this. They didn't synthesize it, but they can purify it. And they can actually get uh, paralysis within 30 seconds with 250 nanometers a nanomolar of mm-hmm. this compound, which is pretty good. It's not mic- two and a half micromolar, so that's not bad. Um, but they noticed something that's very interesting. These this compound is very similar to um, I- alkaloids that bind human serotonin receptors. Mm-hmm. This is a similar kind of uh, main ring structure, although the side chains are are different. They have a, what we call a pyrrolidine ring. And so they take some of these other compounds, they're called uh, uh, HT-13A and HD-13B, and these can also uh, paralyze um, the uh, circaria. Not as good as the SPF, but it suggests that 
these are maybe hitting a serotonin receptor to uh, to paralyze them. Would that paralyze a, a living thing hitting a serotonin receptor, Daniel? You know, I'm actually thinking this is, you know, people always talk about how we should put Prozac in the water, and maybe this is why, because we'll all be happy and just as home free. <laughs> uh, so, That's right. you know, there's there's different, there's a whole class of schistosome, of mm-hmm. serotonin receptors. Yeah. Um, like in, for instance, the gut smooth muscle, smooth muscle um, has certain serotonin receptors, mm-hmm. the neurons in the brain have certain, um, so... I'm not thinking that this alkaloid is going to paralyze human skeletal muscle. Um, but actually, mm-hmm. what, what you bring up is interesting. Like, if anyone starts talking about putting this in the water, is there any impact on, you know, larger vertebrates? Well, so they did test this in mice, right? They want to know. They have a mouse model for infection. Um, so they treat mice with different concentrations, and they treat the circaria, and then they expose the mouse tails to the cercaria, and then six weeks later, they dissect the mice and see if they can count schistosomes uh, in the uh, in the liver. Yeah, they're putting the they're putting like the the mice they're sticking the mou- mouse's mouse tail into these tubes, right? Yeah. These tubes with the uh... yeah for thirty minutes, and that's enough to let the cercaria come in. So they have treated SPF treated and untreated. Mm-hmm. And the untreated controls they get, they recover 83 worms on average. So about 40% of the mice seem to be infected. But mm-hmm. they they got no worms out of the mice treated with SPF, yeah. either 250 nanometers or two and a half micromolar. Nanomolar, I keep saying nanometers. <laughs> and they looked at the, the sections of tissue that you don't see any eggs. So it looks like it completely pre- prevented Infection, so I guess it paralyzes the cercaria, so they can't. So the cercarial tail motion is important not only for motility to get to the target, we'll yeah. say the mouse, the human, but also even for the penetration event. They need that tail for the force to break through that single cell That's right. layer. That's right. Um, so if you can, you know, limit it, you know, it would be complete paralysis. We're seeing complete paralysis here, but just enough of a concentration to prevent it from having the force to penetrate you're not going to get infected. Yeah. Now, they let the mice incubate for six weeks, so I presume the mice are fine. You know, the interesting you know, they is actually, the exposure because they they're just putting the tail yeah, in. Yeah, and the tail with the solution, so yeah. maybe that's not enough. I mean, you almost probably want to, like, now do a toxicity thing. Yeah, you yeah. let the mice swim around. Mice don't like water, by the way. But um, you let them, <laughs> you know, you, you want to see if you, if you get, you know, let's say you were to treat you know, people start saying, oh, we could spray an area where people swim and the water will have a certain concentration of this, you know, by our beach resort, whatever. Um, or even you start putting it into the streams where the people in the village or the lake, is it safe? Yeah. You know, yeah. because all you need to do is break this cycle for enough of a period of time. So you're thinking of environmental treatment with this SPF, right? Yeah. I mean, Not, it's already uh, it's already there at these low concentrations. Yeah, on, the, on the snails. On the right. snails. It's already there, but can we yeah. increase it to a, you know, maybe we promote more growth of this on the snails. Interesting. Uh, I wonder if it would have any effect if you gave the SPF to mice, and then the cercaria would be able to penetrate, but then maybe once they got in the bloodstream, they get paralyzed. That's interesting, yeah. And be yeah. cleared then because they can't go to where they have to go. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, it's hard know. to know because, you know, just because there's other other literature on this. Um, and if we go back to our stage, the this SPF actually doesn't just affect the um, circaria. It may actually have impacts on the myrcidium themselves. Mm-hmm. It mm-hmm. may actually have effects on the maturation um, in the snail. So there, there may be, yeah, you know, so yeah, if yeah. this were at a higher concentration in the water, you might be interrupting more than just this uh, circaria attraction and penetration of human skin. Right. right. So two things I wanted to touch on. First, the mechanism, they say because SPF looks like these other compounds, the HT13s that bind serotonin receptors, they, they say it might antagonize serotonin signaling. You know, there are serotonin-gated channels. And yeah, they're G-coupled. They work through like a G-coupled protein yeah. in, in a lot of the... Yeah. And so I guess that 
is it is a serotonin gated channel involved in neurotransmission? Uh, yes. So that would that could paralyze right yeah. the snail. The other thing is they they mention very interesting. They say we don't know the we don't know anything about the chemical ecology of this. What does uh, SPF do for the rotifer or the snail or both? Right? Mm-hmm. Who makes it? Like comes from the rotifer, but maybe they say the microbiome of the rotifer actually makes this. They don't know if the rotifer is making Interesting, it. Interesting, yeah. Um, and does it help the rotifer in any way? Does it help the uh, snail in some way? So that's those are interesting questions, you know. Uh, aside from the fact that they say this may this holds great promise as an anti schistosome agent, and I'm sure it will be developed in some way, but I think the na- the the chemical ecology is very interesting. Yeah, it's, and I think that's important because let's say, oh, the rotifers, you know, may have this effect, but they may also be protective for the snail population. Right? Yeah. We talked about how yeah. parasites control populations. So you, you go ahead. And you start maybe promoting this particular rotifer, and then the snail population is expanding, and we're thinking it's all good. But you know, where where does this go? Because mm-hmm. um, one of the ways people have tried to control um, schistosomiasis is killing the snails. Yeah, because yeah. schistosomes have a persi- specific snail as part of their life cycle. It's not just any random snail. Yeah, and so if there's some sort of benefit that the snail population gets, you know, some symbiotic thing going on here with the rotifers, because the rotifers right. are living on the yeah. snail shell, so there's some some ecological niche that the uh, rotifers are after. Hmm. And if the snails get a benefit and the snail population expands, they have more snails for the schistosome cycle. So the areas where these infections happen is is the water typically still. Uh, it's usually in the shallows of a lake. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want rapidly. You don't want rapidly moving water for the snail population and for this cycle. So yeah. it's usually to be Lake Victoria is a classic place. Mm-hmm. Um, there's lakes in southern China that I've been to where you know it's all the kids are getting infected. Because that would be good if you wanted to spray. Yep. It wouldn't be flowing and just diluting the. Mm-hmm. SPF constantly, so that might work. Of course, you'd have to do some yeah. environmental impact and make sure you're not messing up other things. Right? I think that's critical because they, you know, people are using toxic, you know, molluscicides in sure. these areas, <laughs> you sure. know, and then telling the people, oh, by the way, I put up a sign in a language that you may or not be able to read. You shouldn't yeah. be swimming in there. Um, but this, uh, hopefully, this SPF is something that for for vertebrates is non toxic, but you know, if you can just break the cycle in certain areas, I mean, and there are hundreds of millions of people suffering from schistosomiasis. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And not only do they suffer, but you think of these areas, the impact upon the economy. You know, you go to uh, Lake Malawi and it is beautiful, but part of the reason it's not a tourist destination is do you want to swim in a lake that is full of schistosomes? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's the crocodiles, yeah. but that's another, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, another approach could be you you uh, embed this in a <clears throat> water insoluble cream or ointment, mm-hmm. put it on people's feet, and that way, and it's almost like the local effect that the snails are getting. You know, yeah, you and it will this... stay there if you use a you know a Vaseline based cream where it's not yeah. going to wash off immediately in the water. That could yeah. prevent infection temporarily. Right? Actually, this will be the other SPF in your SPF. That's right. You put on. You put it in suntan lotion. <laughs> yeah, right. the, the AB and the schistosome <laughs> <laughs> factor. Very interesting. So it's a great example of how you try and figure out why something's not working. In this case, you know, infecting the snails in the lab. It's just erratic. It doesn't always work. You, you track it down and you get something useful. That's that's what I that was what I thought was like you can't yeah. predict. That's the that's why science is so cool. You just got this element of serendipity, right? Yeah. And this may end up being a drug that gets rid of this problem. Who knows, right? I think that's you know one of those uh, you always bring up this. You know, in science, you want to have the ability to be creative and to wander sure. and to think sure. about things because you know it, this was something that someone stumbles across, and for forty years, you know, there's very not much going, and then they finally say, you know what, we really got to figure this out, and yeah, I like it very much. It's very cool. All right, it's time for a new case study. All right, Let's see what we have here. So let's. I have a list. I have like a whole stack here of ones to choose That's good. from. Many quips <laughs> to come, right? 
So let, let me see which one I'm going to pick here among my many. Um, okay. This one I hope, uh, I hope people enjoy. Uh, this was a gentleman that I uh, saw recently. It's a 49-year-old gentleman, and he was sent to uh, my clinic for, I should say, my, my private office mm-hmm. <laughs> for an infectious disease consultation. Um, and this, uh, this man reports that uh, back in August, he visited Hawaii with his family, and after spending some time in, in Hawaii, uh, going to several of the different islands, he flies to California, and there's a big family event going on in California, so he gets together with a bunch of family and friends, and uh, they, they take him out to a, he remembers going to this Pakistani restaurant, which may or may not have anything to do with what happens here, but this is what he tells me. Mm-hmm. Um, it's about a day afterwards, and he starts to notice he's having um, some gastrointestinal issues. He's having a little bit of nausea. He's having some diarrhea. And uh, where does he go? Where, where, where do you go in America when you have medical problems? He goes to urgent care. <laughs> it's like our last person. <laughs> so he goes to urgent care. And they, they get this story and they decide they're going to send him for some stool testing. Um, so they're going to send his stool off for ova and parasites. And they actually look at the, they look at the stool and, um, you know, he gets, he gets a call uh, a couple days later that we've, uh, we've, we've looked at your stool and your stool shows chylomastic mesnili. So I'm going to spell that for our listeners and Vincent. C H I L O. M A S T I X and then M E S N I L I. Right? Hmm. And so he, he they say, don't worry, we're not going to give you any medicine. This is just what, what's shown there. Um, you're going to be okay. But he's a little concerned because his weight over this period of time when he wasn't feeling so great of about a week, his weight drops by 15 pounds. He gains about five back. Um, but now he still weighs 10 pounds less than he used to weigh. And he says, you know, my entire adult life, I have weighed exactly the same. I now weigh 10 pounds less than I used to weigh. And so I was concerned about that. And here it is, end of October. So it's been two months later. He feels completely fine. Um, the bloating is gone. The, the short-lived um, diarrhea that he had is gone. He has no symptoms, but he goes and sees a gastroenterologist. The gastroenterologist, again, orders uh, stool testing. And this time, the stool testing returns with two things that they see in the stool. One is dientamoeba fragilis. And the other, the same, the same chylomastic, chylomastix mesnili. Hmm. Okay, so he comes and sees me now. The the gastroenterologist says, you know, I'm really not sure what to do here. You need to go see Dr. Griffin. He kn- he knows about this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he's not on any medication. Uh, he has no allergies. Um, doesn't smoke, doesn't drink. He's actually an active athletic man. Um, loves to surf, loves to bicycle ride. Uh, nothing in the family. As mentioned, he feels completely fine. Nothing else is going on. He has a completely normal examination. And now the question for us is, what do we do? He's HIV negative, right? HIV negative. All his blood work is unremarkable. Normal white count, normal chemistries. He's just worried about his 10 pounds. He weighs 10 pounds less, and he's got these two things in yeah, his yeah, stool. Yeah. Defragilis. Chylomastix mesnili. Okay. Well, did and while he was in Hawaii, yes, did he have any salads? He did. He did. It's an excellent question. He ate. Yeah. You know, he he describes himself as a very healthy person. So he eats a lot of vegetables. Eats a lot of salads. Um. He actually he remembers at the Pakistani restaurant one. He said it was one of the best meals he's ever had in his life, and he describes having a lamb dish. In in the Pakistani the restaurant. Pakistani restaurant. Mm-hmm. So our listeners, you have your charge here. I think they have everything they need. Yeah, do do my job. <laughs> he yeah, comes to me. What should I do? And so we're going to ask you guys. Okay. 
All right, let's let's uh, we have a little bit of time here, so let's get through some of these emails here. We have a a long one from Kevin, which is titled "Pseudo Parasites." So this is Kevin who sends the long uh, diagnoses in, but he also sent in a separate email. Oh, I know Kevin. <laughs> this topic is beginning to defeat me. I, qu- I quote J. Gordon Thompson. The author regrets that he could not furnish a comprehensive review of all the anomalies, fallacies, and puzzles which might be encountered in man. A discussion on TWIP 175, time 127.42 minutes, concerned one listener's obscure photograph of a 40-centimeter worm ostensibly retrieved from his own feces five years ago. Unfortunately, this poor quality photo made organism identification impossible. Oh, that was Wink's photo. In the podcast, Dr. Pommier suspected that the patient's fecal discovery may have been a mucus cast and speculated that the object in question may have been an artifact. <laughs> that discussion put me in mind of the whole subject of pseudoparasitism, a topic that was touched upon in TWIP 158. I am also goaded to explore this topic due to the vague similarity of the prefixes pseudo and quasi, having noted Dr. Racaniello's delight in the <laughs> latter term. First, to dispose of the etymologies. The Greek pseudos means falsity or falsehood. Compare quasi, which means resembling or simulating. Many of the articles that I review do not specifically define a pseudoparasite, seeming to take the term at face value. The University of Pennsylvania Veterinary Parasitology Department defines it as a parasite which is found in the feces of a host, which it was not infecting. Rather, it just passed through after the animal ate the original host or material contaminated with eggs or cysts. This definition, unfortunately, omits finding in blood smears, urine sputum, etc. The Oxford English Dictionary defines pseudoparasite thus, an organism whose presence within another is interpreted as parasitic, but which is only present by accident, formerly also a hemiparasite, an organism apparently but not strictly parasitic, such as an epiphyte or saprophyte, obsolete. This definition has the merit of not limiting the faker to the feces. Of course, there will be overlap with the term artifact, though strictly speaking, an artifact usually refers to phenomena that result from tissue processing. Example, a platelet superimposed on a red cell simulating an intracellular inclusion. The marginalization of the term pseudoparasite is evidenced by its omission as a mesh heading, medical subject heading, in the PubMed database. In the articles that I reviewed, the term remains undefined and seems to belong to the category of I know it when I see it. Various permutations of the word pseudoparasite in PubMed's advanced search indices show that it is infrequently used. PD6 and 7 do not index or mention the word pseudoparasite. For me, the most recent and egregious example of pseudoparasitism was what I like to call the Loyola worm, or as the debunking 1983 Lancet article dubbed it, the worm that wasn't. In 1983, Luke et al., working at the Loyola Stritch School of Medicine near Chicago, published a paper in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, more or less claiming to have discovered the etiology of toxemia of pregnancy, which they laid at the feet of a previously undescribed worm christened Hydatoxy lualba. This whole unfortunate affair was quickly discredited by multiple authors, providing an object lesson in the hazards of rushing to publication, as well as the folly of not employing experienced parasitologists as collaborators. Strictly speaking, this spurious finding was an artifact, though the did deluded authors saw fit to elevate it to the status of a pseudoparasite. A word on mucus casts. Colmer Hamoud's review on fecal microscopy is one of the few references via PubMed that I could find which mentioned mucus casts. She states that casts can be often seen in persons whose food intake includes bulk-producing food fiber, such as psyllium husk, can be mistaken for adult Ascaris species. Don't miss the endnote reference outlining a gallbladder mucus plug impersonating an ascarid. A general Google image search turns up many interesting photographs of mucus casts with some fantastic photographs of mucus casts on Parasite Gal's blog. These photos show the plausibility of mistaking expelled intestinal slime for a worm. Dr. de Pommier knows what he's talking about. <laughs> Though relevant to this topic, time and energy do not permit a discussion of the recent phenomenon ropeworm or ropeworm. I refer you to the Wikipedia entry on the subject. I'm trying to close. I will only mention a few spurious quasi-pseudo findings that could measure up to our correspondence 40-centimeter specimen, perhaps a horsehair worm, 
nematomorpha or maybe a giant terrestrial turbularian. I'm not making this stuff up. It gets weirder. See the rambling end notes. <laughs> so in these end notes, he puts entries that come up for pseudoparasitism in PubMed and all the the, the uh, things that he finds. Giant hammerhead flatworm can reach 40 centimeters. Female ascaris could reach 40 centimeters. An article on, on a gallbladder mucus plug mimicking an ascaris worm. Have you ever heard of that? No. <laughs> That's no. interesting. Wow. Photographs of rope worms on and on. Terrestrial tuberlarians and some case reports. So there are lots and lots of uh, articles here and discussions of possible pseudoparasites. He, he's, he gives detail on the Loyola worm, which he just discussed, discussed which was wrong. Wow. Um, and some common medical words with the prefix pseudo, other strange pseudo-containing words, pseudofeces, pseudomania. <laughs> and finally, a terminal curiosity. I say no more. Intestinal sand or gravel. Sand colic in horses. This is a Journal of the American Medical Association article from 1900. Sand in horses. Wow. In the intestine. It's a frequent finding. I'm not surprised because... Yeah, I wouldn't be. I wouldn't horses be. eat food that has sand in it outside. Yeah, we have a one of those dogs that we're training for the canine companions to help someone with disabilities. And uh, she's a wonderful dog, except she, we took her to the beach a few weeks back. Someone had a barbecue, and so there were small stones, but they had, like, drippings from the burgers or wherever they had grilled. So, of mm -hmm. course, she starts eating those. And, yeah, I mean, you know. <laughs> well, I, tell, I suggest listeners, and in particular Wink, because this was actually in response to Wink's photo. Yeah, yeah. At this worm. Take a look at the... Um, Email microbe.tv slash twip, and you will find all the episodes there, and you can go to letters. Mm -hmm. Just click it, and you'll see them. Yeah, it's always tough. I mean, as you were reading this, I'm always thinking about all the poor people that come to me with with delusional um, ideas yeah. about parasites. And, and it's really, I mean, these people are suffering. I just saw someone... Um, a week ago and it was the last patient of the day and they brought in their bag with all their stuff and were describing these um, mites that they felt they were infected with, but they knew they were not, you know, normal mites. And the story was that because if they would breathe on a mirror, that the carbon dioxide would cause the, the mites to jump from the mirror and then infect their mouth. And, you know, it's just tough. Yeah. It's wow. really tough. Wow. These. Yeah. All right, that is TWIP177. You can find it at microbe.tv slash TWIP. And, of course, it's on any podcast player uh, on your phone or tablet. And if you do listen, please subscribe so you get every episode free automatically and lets us know how many people are listening. If you like what we do, consider supporting us financially. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. We have ways you can give money at, say, a dollar a month with Patreon or PayPal. Send your questions and comments and case guesses, of course, educated case guesses to twip at microbe.tv. Daniel Griffin is at Columbia University Irving Medical Center, parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, a pleasure as always. We should mention that over at parasiteswithoutborders.com, which has the, the wonderful mission of Spreading information about parasites to getting, places where getting it's needed, knowledge right? to the people and places that need it the most, like giving away forty thousand copies. Is that forty thousand? Forty thousand. Amazing. Copies. Yeah, you can uh, donate to them as well, right? You yes. have a way over that. Yeah, website. if you come to parasiteswithoutborders dot com, and we have uh, several different ways of donating. You can, as I think our emailer was it Chris who mentioned, mm -hmm. you can uh, sign up to be a Patreon. You can donate directly. Um, you know it it takes time it takes money to get all these books and videos and educational resources out there so uh we would love to help we'd love your support be part of the mission parasites without borders.com i'm vincent racaniello you can find me at virology.ws music on twip is by ronald jenkies thanks for that and thanks to asm for their support You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another, Another twip, twip is parasitic. parasitic.